Hello, I'm Tony Guida. This is my New York. Ma Rainey is back. When I got there, they began to say. The mother of the blues, scorching audiences again in the Netflix adaptation of Ma Rainey's Black Bottom by playwright August Wilson. Wilson transformed American theater with an unparalleled achievement. His 10-play portrait of the lives of everyday black people whose casual dialogue rings with the rhythms of poetry. Tonight, we begin a special two-part celebration of the artist some have called the American Bard. I am delighted to welcome to the program Joan Harrington. She is the director of the School of Theater and Dance at Western Michigan University. She's also the author of I Ain't Sorry for Nothing I Done, August Wilson's Process of Playwriting. And she was a dramaturge for Fences and a longtime friend of August Wilson. Welcome, Joan. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's a delight. Um, I want to begin with a provocative statement by August Wilson himself. Listen to this. I think that blacks as a people that we have made, to my mind, some incorrect choices. I think we should have stayed in the South. Joan, what did he mean by that? Well, I think uh, as, as a lot of his work explores, uh, August was very interested in the question of whether life really was better for African-Americans who came North during the reconstruction period and the kind of challenges that that created for them and what they left behind and how difficult it was for, main, for them to maintain that connection. Uh, and a lot of his plays really center on that theme. It weaves his way through almost everything that he's written. He, he's talking, is he, about losing essential parts of the culture, their culture uh, by, by migrating north? I think he's losing the connection. He, he's concerned about the loss of the connection to African culture, mm -hmm. which was maintained while African Americans were in the South, but as they came North and were pressured towards assimilation, those cultural connections were severed. And August found that to be incredibly damaging um, to, to African Americans in the North and pondered and considered through his writing whether or not that was the right choice. A, a, a strong cultural connection for him is the blues. And uh, he first came to them as what, with Bessie Smith or uh, an intro, what a name of her, what a name of that song. <laughs> that uh, first nobody heard. makes a jelly roll like mine. Yeah. And, and he yeah, heard he that in one. record store and apocryphal story is that he came back to the boarding house in which he was living and played it 23 times in a row. The blues were, uh, front and center for him in terms of a cultural connection, if I'm getting this right, to, uh, to black lives, for black lives. Well, August said that everything, everything you want to know about the black experience is contained within the blues. So for him, that was just a wealth of inspiration. In almost all of his plays, you find that the characters are singing the blues, the characters are writing the blues, Ma Rainey being probably the most clear example, but in, in, in Piano Lesson, in Joe Turner, blues are, are, are central to the lives of almost all of his characters. Ma Rainey was, of course, you know, about the great renowned blues singer, Ma Rainey, Gertrude Pridgett, who was not only a, a renowned performer, but she wrote many of her, many of her songs. And, and we, and of course, Ma Rainey's Black Bottom is August Wilson's tribute to her, but also, a reflection about the blues. Talk, talk to us about the play and its principal, its two principal uh, characters, Ma Rainey and, and the trumpet player, Levy. Well, Ma, Ma Rainey, a very successful blues singer, um, very popular, huge following in the South, has been invited to come up North to record her music in a recording studio in Chicago. Um, so she comes up with her band and the play really focuses on what that experience is for her and whether there really is a place for her and how she's received and whether or not they have much respect for her music. She's recently added a young man to her band, Levy, um, who does not agree that the kind of music she's creating has a place in the future. 
and wants to be moving music forward and is writing a different kind of music and really trying to come out from under that and make his own place. Um, but as the play reveals, the, the white music world is not very interested in either one of them as artists. He's, Levy is, is um, renouncing, or maybe that's too strong a word, but uh, moving away from the kind of blues that Ma is uh, associated with and calling it jug band music. And right. he, doesn't, he doesn't understand uh, the blues, but Ma tells us what is the meaning what, uh, of the blues to black folks. Let's, let's listen to this. White folk don't understand about the blues. They hear it come out, but they don't know how it got there. They don't understand that that's life's way of talking. You don't sing to feel better. You sing because that's the way you understand it, life. Understanding life, she says. And I, I guess the, should I infer that um, she's saying that, that Levy doesn't understand life? I think she's saying that Levy has lost, and this is a, a big theme for August and gets back to where you started the show, Tony, a connection to his cultural past. He does not respect it. He does not find kinship. And so he is not able to learn from it. So his understanding of life from Ma's point of view and also from August's point of view is limited, um, which in the course of this play will cause his downfall. Yeah, he's making a bet as you began to suggest uh, that when he puts his band together and the, the studio, the recording studio owner who has promised him, you know, he'll record it, that he's gonna, he's gonna really make it and he's gonna gain somehow that that's gonna, it, it, in his mind, at least um, equal Ma's fame and, and maybe even garner white, white uh, respect. Let's listen to Levy himself talking about this. As soon as I get my band together and record them songs Mr. Sturdivant done told me I can make, I'm going to be like Ma and tell the white man just what he can do. Ma tell Mr. Irvin she leaving, Mr. Irvin get down on his knees and beg her to stay. That's the way I'm going to be. Make the white man respect me. Uh, another, I think, failure to understand the world that's going on around him. Yeah, so I think, you know, um... And, and again, this gets back to, so again, where you started the question of assimilation, that if he makes, that the reason that they don't respect Ma is because the kind of music that she's making is not really of interest to them, that if he gives up that music and makes what he considers to be new music, the kind of music that will be more popular with white people, yeah. um, that he will be of more value to them than Ma is of value to them. Um, but as the play reveals to us eventually that is very misguided um, and, the, and he suffers very much for the disconnection that he's created for himself. Yeah, and his, uh, his bid uh, for, for white respect misunderstands what Ma's going through. They don't care nothing about me. All they want is my voice. Well, I done learned that. And they're going to treat me the way I want to be treated, no matter how much it hurt them. You know, she's going to do what she can, I guess, to exercise her power. And she, of course, is out of her element in Chicago. She's big in the South. She's big in the South, yes. And I think the movie actually helped really drive that home even more than the play did. Um, for those people who've seen the movie, having starting it out with those scenes of her in the South, which are not in the play, um, really drove home the contrast. Also the scene when she's in the hotel and how she's treated in the hotel, uh, how she's treated on the street by the policemen. Um, you know, all of those insults which surround her coming to the North to record this music. And Levy, of course, as you've been suggesting, is undone by the by the imbalance of power, the, the racism. He's he's uh, he's he's going to lose that bet, and it's going to wind up tragically. Having lost all of his power in the exchange with the white man, um, he 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 resorts to black on black violence as his only way to feel any kind of manhood. You've mentioned assimilation a couple of times, Joan, and and. 
August himself talked about that and about this play specifically when he was um, apparently at uh, uh, the university uh, talking to the university students there. Uh, let's listen to August Wilson about assimilation and this play. I was talking with some kids at Morgan State University about these very same things, and one kid said to me, he said, Miss Wilson, can't we Europeanize ourselves just a little bit in order to get ahead? You see, and he was proving exactly the point that I was making, that in order to get ahead, this is what you have to do. And as a 17 and 18-year-old uh, kid, he recognized that. So he's... Um... I, th I think he's just, I think, you know, he's bemoaning the fact that this young, young man um, thinks that, that, that this is the case, that in order to get ahead, he has to, what was the phrase, Europeanize himself, that yeah. he has to give up that culture. And, and August will tell him, as he does in all of the plays, that's exactly, that's exactly wrong. And you know, there's that great quote in, in Piano Lesson where he says, if you drop the ball and you keep running, it's not going to be a touchdown. You have to go back and pick up the ball. Right. right? You have to carry this with you or, or, or you're not going to succeed. And Levy's an example. Europe, Europeanizing his music results in him being totally betrayed um, by the industry. Let's move on, Joan, to Fences, which was the next play that August was writing after Mom. And as I mentioned earlier, you were dramaturg, and we'll get into that more later. Uh, but, uh, you know, in like 10 words or less, what does a dramaturg do? Um, well, uh, we do a variety of things. We're sort of a service to playwrights and playwrights to the artists. So in a new play development, um, we are consultants, editors, sounding boards, uh, to playwrights as they develop the new work. So that was my relationship with August on the development of Fences. Part of what August apparently was accomplished or trying to accomplish with Fences and obviously did um, was that uh, he was responding to the criticism of Ma Rainey. From, yes. uh, from, talk about that a little bit. Well, when Ma Rainey was beginning to um, um, have its, its life and being developed, um, a lot, it was very much a two part play. So the world of Ma on one hand and the world of the band in the band room on the other, much more so in the play than if the movie, if you've only seen the movie. Bifurcated was the criticism that was levied at Wilson. Yeah. This was not, the play was not well structured that this back and forth was ineffective. So literally on the bus, when he was leaving the Eugene O'Neill Theater Center, after he had been working on Ma Rainey, he said, well, I will show them that I can write a play in a traditional Eurocentric structure. And he started the draft of Fences there on the bus and had an outline first draft by the time he arrived home. August wow. didn't arrive, by the way. <laughs> wow. That, that quickly? That, <laughs> that, that immediately? Yeah, he, just, he, he laid out the structure just really as evidence. He said, well, I can do this. The issue is not that I can't do it, it's that I chose not to. Um, so mm. he did that with that and then the rest of his career kind of backed off and went back to really the way he wanted to write. Well, he sure showed he could write a Eurocentric, a Western a straight line, if you will, play with Fences, which I, I think is probably his best known and certainly most celebrated uh, piece. Um, you had an interesting metaphor, not metaphor, analogy for me about Fences, you called it he, August Wilson's uh, death of a salesman. Tell me what you meant by that. Well, I think, you know, in, in the way that it's a sort of a, a quintessential structure um, about uh, a man who is um, ruined by his own ambition. Um, but the circumstances are quite different um, in that for Troy, so much of his ruin came at the hand of white society that did not afford him an opportunity to play baseball or an opportunity to advance in his job or an opportunity even to learn to read. Um, so akin in that they're each looking at a man who had dreams and hopes for his life and reaches a certain point and must reconcile the fact that those will never come true. Um, but for August, very much of that for Troy is the circumstance of him being black in a white world. Yeah, Troy Maxson, uh, American Dream denied him. And as you say, principally by racism, where for Willie Loman, 
low man, uh, mm -hmm. interesting name for that character, uh, the dream denied for, for other reasons. Um, and I, uh, August, in describing the character to you one time, told you in an interview you did with him, uh, white America pays no attention to people like Troy Maxson. Mm -hmm. they, you know, no interest. I mean, you know, a, a stellar athlete denied the opportunity to, um, to play ball. Um, a talented, smart man denied the opportunity to learn to read. Um, and, and just really not on any white radar in terms of, you know, what, what that meant um, for this man and his family. There seems to be a, a theme of responsibility in the play, Troy feeling responsibility to the family, Rose, his wife feeling responsibility uh, to him over the 18 years they've been together. And, and, um, but at the same time, Troy is selfish, making choices that where he puts his own wants ahead of the responsibility. And that's part of the downfall of Troy, isn't it? Yes, well, you know, he justifies for himself that his action is okay in response to the things that he has been denied, that he needed that to keep going. And yes, selfish in that he did not think about what that would mean for his wife. The audience learned, we all learned that uh, Troy has had a, uh, an affair, young woman, um, and she got pregnant, had the baby, but died in childbirth. And now, uh, now what, Tr Troy wants, Troy, Troy wants to bring the baby. baby home to ask his wife, Rose, to raise the child um, because he has no, the child has, has, has no mother and it has no place else to go. And, and in probably one of Wilson's best known lines, um, Rose says to him, this baby got a mama, but you a womanless man. I mean, yes. I, mean, I will I will raise this child, but we will no longer be as we were before. That is an impossibility. And just a little interesting side note, when um, when the play was first being produced and she said that line, the audience, you could hear them make a sound that evidenced how they felt about Troy in this moment and what he had asked. So much so that James Earl Jones once asked August to remove her line from the play because there was just so much heat coming at him when she said, this baby got a mama, but you a womanless man. But the ultimate price he has to pay is trying to be responsible and keep his family together. And because of his choice, he loses both his wife and his son. Yeah, they're, they're not bedmates anymore. Uh, that, the, the scene between um, Troy and Rose, which goes on for eight, nine, 10 minutes in the backyard, is just searing and this is just a bit of it where he's told Rose what's going on and she just is stunned and, uh, and well, we'll pick it up there. We ain't talking about baseball. We're talking about you going off and laying up with another woman and bringing it home to me. That's what we're talking about. We're not Rose, talking about no baseball. you're not listening to me. I'm trying to explain it to you the best way I know how. It's not easy for me to admit that I've been standing in the same place for 18 years. Well, I've been standing with you. I've been right here with you, Troy. I got a life, too. I gave 18 years of my life to stand in the same spot as you. Don't you think I ever wanted other things? Don't you think I had dreams and hopes? What about my life? What about me? And she's... You know, she she goes on to say that what you said. You know, she she had these dreams. She wanted, to, she she thought about doing the same thing he did, but but um, she was going to stick, and he didn't. I have the sense that, I have the sense that August um, was impressed, or at least it made a it made some kind of impression on him that when at times he saw this play as playing across racial lines. I think that um, more than Ma Rainey had um, this play, partially because of its structure, um, partially because it is at its core a family drama, uh, attracted more white audience than Ma Rainey had, and possibly more white audience than any of his plays since then have attracted. Mm. Uh, and there were a lot of people who responded to it 
to the story of the father and the son, to the story of the husband and wife, sort of a little bit removing the racial context, which very much existed for Wilson, but to look beyond and find resonance for themselves in the work. Yeah, you, exactly. And uh, August tells an anecdote about when the play was performed at Yale Rep, afterwards meeting an, uh, an old uh, Yugoslavian man who had come to uh, the performance about, I guess he was in New Haven, uh, you know, because his grandson was at Yale and, and he watches, he, <laughs> he, he, uh, he sees the performance and outside on the sidewalk later, listen to August talk about what this man told him. And he stood there out on the sidewalk, uh, talking to me with tears in his eyes and in very broken English trying to tell me that this character, Troy Maxson from Fences, was his father. And I just thought that, I mean, that's when I first became aware that the play was reading across uh, racial and cultural lines. There's another um, anecdote in which uh, August talks about a psychiatrist in Chicago who's uh, telling friends, uh, you know, I've got four new clients, uh, people who've all been too white, too black, who've all been to this play and want to come to me and talk about their father. <laughs> yeah. Um, August is just so incredibly uh, celebrated for his dialogue. And I want to, I want to get into, uh, get into that a little bit more. But uh, before we do, what, what else can you tell me about the experience of working on Fences? The Eugene O'Neill Theater Center is an, a new play development where they bring in actors and directors from all over the country and very competitive process, select plays that they will advance. Um, so Fences was there. Ma Rainey had been there the, the summer before. Uh, August had submitted a couple of other plays before Ma Rainey was accepted. That was his first, Fences was his second. Uh, and the first time we read through the play in performance, it was five and a half hours long. Whoa. <laughs> um, it's August, you know, tends to write. Um, and so one of the one of the suggestions from, you know, the, the O'Neill has a number of people who are producers, directors in the industry. And it's just, well, maybe, maybe you want to make it a little bit shorter. To which August said, well, did people say that to Shakespeare? You know, it's, um, so by the time we read it the second time, I think it was about three and a half hours long. That line about, the, did people say that to Shakespeare? It's not, not a few critics and, and people who've seen August Wilson and work have, have called him the American bard. Yes. Well, you know, as he as he went on, he felt a little bit less pressure to fit his plays into sort of the the acceptable amount of time that people think others want to be in the theater. Um, and you know, it's a really interesting thing about August is when he um, takes material out of his plays, he puts it aside, and very frequently it finds its way into another play later on. Mm. So there are things that came out of Fences that actually found their way into some of the later plays, which I think is just fascinating the way the material can morph into a completely different drama. Um, but uh, well, you, you know, know, it's great. It was just, um, Rogus is an instinctual writer. Um, he senses when something is right or wrong in a character or in a scene and really had, was really beginning to develop at that time his instincts about how to put his plays together. You, you make that point and, and so much more in this book of yours, I Ain't Sorry for Nothing I Done, uh, his process of playwriting. You write extensively about him moving scenes or changing characters. Well, I think, you know, it's, it's interesting for a playwright to write a play where they can take a scene from one place and put it somewhere else in the play. That's something that's very unusual in a traditional Eurocentric structure, as I said. And the whole, it will just, the reverberation will come through the whole play in terms of when we get information or when we learn something or how something lands. Uh, so that's a very interesting way to structure. And it's very much, uh, you know, August is interested, uh, uh, inspired by the uh, artist Romare Bearden, who is a collagist. Mm -hmm. You know, so he takes pieces of things and puts them places. And then as he's working, he might move those pieces around. And it's really interesting that a playwright could do the same thing. When we come to the play, it would be almost impossible for us to conceive that any of the scenes that we're witnessing could have been anywhere else in the work because it works so perfectly by the time we come to it. 
But the fact that he played with it and fussed with it and moved things from one place to another and said, yes, yes, that's, that, that's where I want it. Now it makes sense to me mm. is just fabulous. Just and then of course the characters, ordinary folk um, talk in a vernacular that is rhythmic and musical and poetic and August is uh, renowned for his dialogue. And at the beginning, he didn't have a clue how to do that. Listen to this. I couldn't write dialogue. And the reason I couldn't write dialogue is because I was not, uh, um, I, didn't, I didn't see the value in the way black spoke. I, I, I thought you had to change it in order to make it uh, into art. Uh, and I asked my friend Rob Penny, who was a playwright, how do you make them talk? And he said, you don't, you listen to them. Well, you listen to them. And he listened awfully well and gave us characters in this 10 part uh, profile of Black Lives in America that are just, uh, that burn in your brain. I mean, they, they, you never forget these people. And um, we are going to explore that further uh, with Joan Harrington next time on part two of this uh, special uh, celebration of August Wilson, and I hope you will join us again next week. <laughs>